how we think about quantum mechanics, how it's been taught since it was first developed a hundred years ago, has its problems. There are assumptions in this conventional Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics that bring about unanswered questions, like on what scale does superposition break down? Does human consciousness actually affect our reality in the unexpected ways it seems to? Hugh Everett, a graduate student at Princeton in the late 50s, came up with his own theory that offers solutions to some of these problems, and also introduces parallel universes. I'm going to walk you through the assumptions in our conventional interpretation and a paradox that arises from them, a paradox that led Everett to make some serious adjustments. Here are the assumptions. Any isolated system is completely described by a wave function. Wave functions are just what we use to describe quantum systems, and they are all that we need to do so. The next assumption is that these wave functions can change over time in two fundamental ways. The first way being that they obey the Schrodinger equation. Just like how classical systems obey Newton's second law, wave functions evolve continuously and deterministically according to the Schrodinger equation. The second way wave functions can change is by collapsing when we measure them. If a particle is described with a wave function in some superposition of states, when we make a measurement to determine the location of that particle, the wave function collapses. The wave function is behaving nicely according to the Schrodinger equation up until it is observed, at which point it transforms instantaneously to a particular state. If this feels weird to you, it should. What constitutes a measurement? Who can be an observer? How can wave functions know when we are looking at them? How exactly does this collapse happen? The idea of wave function collapse, which was formulated by Heisenberg and Bohr, seems to frame quantum mechanics in such a way where human consciousness has a supreme influence on how things behave. And maybe it does. But this idea doesn't really seem to fit well with modern science. Now let's talk about a paradox that arises from conventional quantum mechanics when there's more than one observer involved. Alice is in an isolated room with a quantum system described by a wave function, which is in some superposition of states. A second observer, Bob, is outside the room. Alice performs a measurement on the quantum system, which collapses its wave function. She then writes down the result of her measurement in a notebook. Bob has been outside the room this entire time. He knows there's a quantum system in the room in some superposition of states, but he does not know when Alice performed her measurement. Let's say that he walks into the room one hour after Alice measured the quantum system. Upon entering the room and seeing Alice's measurement result written in the notebook, Bob has made his measurement on the quantum system. All Bob had to do to perform his measurement was look at her notebook. They will agree on the current state of the system and that there was a collapse, but from Bob's perspective, the wave function did not collapse until he walked into the room and saw the notebook. Alice, however, believes it to have collapsed when she made her measurement an hour before. Alice and Bob are both valid observers of the quantum system, and they will disagree on how the wave function changed over time. Bob will be convinced that it obeyed the Schrodinger equation for an hour longer than Alice does. We expect the wave function is an objective description of a quantum system. The wave function describing a given system shouldn't behave differently from Alice's eyes than from Bob's. The subjectivity of the observer in this thought experiment highlights that there's something not quite right about our current understanding. In his thesis published in 1957, Hugh Everett outlined this paradox and proposed some possible resolutions. One way of dealing with the paradox would be to assert that we can't have more than one observer in the universe, which doesn't really feel right. Another alternative is that quantum mechanics just doesn't apply to observers or measuring devices or any macroscopic system. 
Both of these alternatives are hard to defend, and Everett was not satisfied. He also wasn't willing to let go of the assumption that a wave function is all that we need to fully describe any quantum system. Everett took a radical approach and abandoned the idea of wave function collapse entirely. The theory he founded stems from the assumption that quantum states are evolving continuously according to the Schrodinger equation all the time, even when we do look at them. The wave function simply does not collapse. His alternative has some attractive advantages. It means that quantum theory applies to the entire universe at any scale, and measurement is no longer a special or weird process since it does not cause any mystical collapse. The only catch is that it means there are parallel universes. Everett redefines a quantum measurement as a generation of entanglement between two subsystems. Notice, this does not depend on observers at all. He has completely eliminated the subjective nature of observation that seemed so fundamental to quantum mechanics. This is partly why his work was not well received by the physics community at the time of his research, and only much later was actually given a chance. He presented his work to Bohr, but it was essentially rejected, and pretty much turned Everett away from academia entirely. He only worked on his theory for a total of three years. Every time I make a measurement on a system, there is a world in which I measure a particle at this location, and there is another world where I measure a particle at a different location. I become entangled with the subsystem that is the particle that I'm measuring. The many worlds interpretation brings up some unsettling questions about identity. These parallel worlds that come out of the math behind quantum mechanics are hard to grapple with. Everett himself said that the price to pay for having a complete theory is that you have to get rid of the concept of the uniqueness of an observer with its somewhat disconcerting philosophical implications. What do you think? How, if at all, does this theory change our individual identities? I made this video for a course I took on quantum information, and there's so much more to talk about here, but that's all for today.